Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 YWCA Utah Virtual Legislative Recap. My name is Gabriela Archuleta. I use she, her, AF pronouns. I'm the Public Policy Director at YWCA, and I have the honor to serve as your moderator today. The purpose for our panel is to further our mission to eliminate racism and empower women through discussion of nonpartisan policy areas that impact women, femme, non-binary, and families in our state. This event is being recorded and we will post it on our channels after the event. Thank you to those of you who submitted questions when you registered, we incorporated as many as we could. We won't be taking additional questions during this event, but we encourage your virtual participation by using the emojis at the bottom of your Zoom screen to respond to the conversation. Today marks the end of Women's History Month, and it also is International Transgender Day of Visibility, a day that is dedicated to honor and empower transgender people, as well as raise awareness of the discrimination they continue to face. Today, we benefit from the amazing people who, had, who have advanced justice and equity, and we acknowledge that there is much work still left to do. With our mission's focus on racial and gender equity, we are uniquely poised to elevate this discussion and push for better policies, and that's what we plan to do today. I just want to share with you that this year we had the opportunity to hire three paid policy fellows, Rehana Baksh, Samantha Tiborcio Escalante, and Jenna Williams, and with this cohort, we are launching our racial equity analysis initiative. So we are writing race, race equity analyses on bills that were considered during the legislative session. We will be publishing those on our website in the coming weeks. And if you are interested in getting word of that, uh, you can sign up for our policy advocacy email newsletter and Jenna's going to drop the link to uh, where you can sign up for that in the chat. I also would like to invite you to join us to uh, participate in our Stand Against Racism Challenge. It's our 21 day challenge for this year. It starts on April 4th and that link will be in the chat as well. We also have our leader luncheon coming up on May 20th and our keynote speaker is the uh, incredible uh, Dr. Angela Davis. This year, our public policy committee identified six broad policy priority areas, which are child care, domestic and sexual violence, housing, mental health, racial and gender equity, and reproductive health. During the session, we tracked over 140 bills and we took positions on close to 70 of them. We don't have time today to talk about all of those, but you can check out our website and we have a document that shows the positions we took and the outcomes of those bills. Today, we are going to focus on three broad areas, domestic and sexual violence, racial and gender, gender equity, and advocacy and strategy. But first, I would like to introduce you to uh, somebody who has dedicated their life to racial and gender equity. Sandra Stokes is our Chief Mission Impact Officer at the YWCA. She has worked within the nonprofit sector for over 21 years. Her passion for racial equity and social justice and inclusion and belonging is present in all that she does. As a seasoned facilitator, she is at her best in working with groups and organizations to increase their understanding of structural racism, intersectionality, and implicit bias. Sandra has a master's in public administration with an emphasis on executive leadership from the University of Utah and is currently participating in the University of Utah's Transformational Operations for Government and Nonprofits course. Sandra, thank you so much for being here today and being willing to share your remarks with us on the importance of focusing on racial and gender equity in public policy work. Thank you, Gabe. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see your faces. So thank you all for being here today. Um, and I hope that you are enjoying the, enjoying the warmer wa weather despite like the great clouds, because I'll take that any day. Uh, I am very fortunate to work alongside of our dedicated policy team and very grateful for the work that they do and how y'all just have taken this on with compassion, care, and keeping racial equity uh, rooted in our policy efforts. So I just wanted to welcome everyone and just share a little bit as part of our efforts here at the YWCA to put action to how we eliminate racism, part of that extended to our policy work. And with our policy work, well, we continue to use a racial equity analysis tool when looking at the policies in which um, we take on, um, whether we support or oppose. And the why for that is rooted in race, advancing racial justice 
equity, gender equity. It's looking at how do we get specific, explicit, and intentional, <clears throat> excuse me, when examining the different policies that could either advance or burden uh, many of our BIPOC and QT BIPOC communities. And I was really grateful uh, to the policy team to start to lean into that. And we used five questions to drive our policy um, at racial equity lens. And we um, used those questions that were provided to us through the Race Matters Institute. And those five questions um, get really specific at looking at the different racial identities of our community groups and the impact that any proposed bill would either um, increase, enhance, provide more access or deny thereof. And that just kind of helped anchor us in our why when it was trying to look at how we are working to eliminate racism. And that was externally with our policy work. Internally, um, we have been spending this time as well as a staff continually to lean in for ourselves at looking at how uh, and what we are doing in our own efforts to eliminate racism as a staff while enduring uh, the pandemic. Um, we're still pandemicing, but our work um, also just made sure it encompassed always how racial equity uh, is impacted by also the pandemic. So some of the ways we look at these services as a staff is by continually to, to hold our affinity groups um, that are held monthly. Uh, we held all staff meetings on eliminating racism and just trying to keep those conversations going. And we also continue to look at our own policies and our own procedures and look at how we can strengthen uh, which ones we need to abandon, which ones we need to reimagine and recreate as we look at how do we advance um, racial equity here at the YWCA. So I just always like to point that out that this work has to be done internally and externally as we look at the systems in which we all have to operate within, live within, and then reimagine how do we create those systems in a more liberatory fashion and work towards uh, eliminating racism and empowering women as part of our mission and its call to action that it represents for us. So again, just a big shout out to our policy team um, for taking that work on. And for our panelists today, thank you for the work that you all are doing and the ways that we look at policy as a tool for systemic change. And that's really what we're looking at is how do we keep making these um, big jumps to improve the conditions in which we all live in and really get intentional about how do we reimagine and re-envision moving forward as we advance racial and gender equity. So thank you for joining us today. I appreciate the time to speak to you all and I look forward to hearing from our panelists. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you so much, Sandra, for those inspiring words and just sharing with everybody how we are taking up the call to action. Now it's time to introduce our esteemed panel. I am going to go in alphabetical order. Senator Luz Escamilla represents District 1, which includes Salt Lake County. She has served in the legislature for 14 years and holds a position in Democrat leadership as minority whip. Senator Escamilla is a business consultant and owner and has spent many years advocating for children and families. She holds a degree in business marketing and an Master of Public Administration from the University of Utah. Senator Iwamoto represents District 4 in Salt Lake County. She has served in the legislature for eight years and holds a position in Democratic leadership as Assistant Minority Whip. Senator Iwamoto previously served on the Salt Lake County Council as an attorney by trade. She completed her undergraduate work at the University of Utah and earned a law degree from UC Davis School of Law. Representative Marsha Judkins represents District 61 in Utah County. This is her fourth year of serving in the legislature with the Republican Party. She earned a BA in political science and a master of public administration from BYU. She currently works as an adjunct math professor at Utah Valley University. She was a stay at home mom for many years and has served in various leadership roles throughout the community. And finally, Representative Angela Romero represents District 26 in Salt Lake County. This is her 10th year of serving in the legislature. She's been instrumental in leading the work on missing and murdered indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit. She works as a community programs manager for Salt Lake City. She always has had a passion to serve and growing up in Tooele, Utah, she was raised by her grandparents whose dedication to raising a hardworking, well-educated woman inspired her to pursue college, graduating with a bachelor's degree in political science and a master's degree in public administration from the University of Utah. And I just have to say those are very small blips of what their actual bios are because they do 
so much in this community. So thank you all so much for being here. We are going to go on to our first topic, which is domestic and sexual violence, which all of you have a lot of experience working in. Uh, domestic violence and sexual violence continues to be a critical problem. Which you build a website for a major brand with more than 200 million users using Wix. All right. <laughs> okay, so uh, it continues to be a critical problem in Utah. Survivors face a myriad of barriers of safety and well being, and every single one of you sponsored or floor, floor sponsored bills that improve the safety and well being of experiencing of people experiencing domestic and sexual violence. Thank you so much for your work in these areas. I'm going to highlight a bill or two that each of you championed and asked you to talk about it. So we'll start with you, Senator Escamilla. One of the bills that you co sponsored was HB 351 domestic violence modifications, which really talks about the need to have really good data on domestic violence. Will you talk about the importance of having good data, how that impacts policy, and if you have plans to run this bill again next year? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Gabe. It's always a pleasure to join the community of the YWCA and um, great friends and amazing women from the legislature. I Not only are my colleagues, but I call them friends. So it's always nice to, to be able to sit and share some of the work we are um, you know, focusing in in the state legislature. Um, just raise one issue as we continue to have this conversation to recognize that the more women we get elected, I think the better it will be for um, specifically some of the issues that will be um, discussed today. We have great allies, obviously, with men on these issues, but uh, I've seen women just taking the extra step to making things happen. So I'll just put it out there as we are in an election cycle to focus on on great women um, that are you know just committed to uh, keeping uh, families and individuals safe. So I um, yeah, thanks for that that introduction. And in this bill, actually, the domestic violence modification, it was a very important bill. Um, full credit to Representative Peru. She is the chief sponsor of the bill. But we we served together in interim in um, the criminal justice law enforcement. Um, interim committee. And one of the things that continues to be an issue is the standardization of data collection. And, you know, we always hear how important data is. And the, the challenge is, first is all the different agencies that need to bring the data so we can make sense to it. So one of the things that this bill, and, and let me just say the bill didn't pass. There are two pieces to what was the challenge on the bill. One is it's a task force. And um, many of my colleagues here know that there's been a, a policy almost not to create task force. It's very challenging now to create task force. And we got the funding, we made some modifications and we felt we were so close, but at the end, um, leadership on both um, chambers and majority leadership decided that there was not gonna be any more task force at that point. So I, I think they understand the importance and we're gonna we're coming back with it. So yeah, Representative Perusia and I are committed to bringing this bill back. But what is so critical about this bill is one, the way we define lethality um, and the assessment of lethality is very critical. So many different the agencies, especially law enforcement, have different tools to assess this. What this bill was going to do is we were going to standardize that definition and make sure that in this data collection process, the task force was going to review give recommendations to law enforcement agencies of what we want to see as a lethality um, assessment tool. One, keep that information coming our way, meaning the task force, so then they can distribute that information to the legislature. I find that to be critical. And we've attempted to do that standardization of assessment tools and um, trauma, what we call trauma-informed um, you know, work. And I work with now, again, coming Representative Ivory just came back to the legislature and prior to him leaving, him and um, the two of us run legislation on trauma informed. So I like that this specific task force on domestic violence, which is very important and very unique, was going to assess that piece, put recommendations, engage with law enforcement on how that is being um, is being implemented, that assessment tool. And then the other part is, which I thought it was really critical, there were some modifications. That's why it has the word modifications because they were kind of like doing some cleanup on language, but there's also that reporting mechanism coming back to the legislature for reporting. 
that will create this task force, which has specific membership that I think is critical to have all the stakeholders at the table. And those are always hard. I mean, those are big groups to bring together. And then um, the other part besides uh, the lethality component is, um, is if you look at the membership, we are addressing issues of individuals experiencing homelessness because we've seen also an increase on um, domestic violence and sexual assault in those communities. And, um, you know, agencies, uh, League of Cities and Towns, I mean, recognizing that this has to be a monumental um, lift from every angle of local state government and also the agencies and the different communities that are obviously impacted. So I will say that's a, a little recap of that bill. I'm, I'm excited. I'm glad that um, Representative Perushi is still committed on working on this. And, um, you know, sometimes it takes more than one session to get things done. So um, not a, a bad, I, I don't think it's a, it was a bad thing that it didn't pass. It was in the ideal scenario, but we're coming back. Yeah, thank you so much for your work on that. And I love that you're taking that macro level, level approach and it's going to help in so many ways. I mean, for as nonprofits, we need to apply for grants and we need to have the data and it's just going to help have that and really look at what's uh, really advance our work in the state. So thank you so much. Now, uh, Senator Iwamoto, I'm turning to you uh, to talk about a bill that helps remove barriers to financial assistance. There are many reasons survivors of crimes may not want to report a crime to law enforcement, but that doesn't take away from their need to access resources, including crime victim reparations. You were the floor sponsor for HB 228 crime victim reparations amendments that uh, Representative Ivory sponsored. Will you talk about how this bill increases resources for survivors of sexual assault and strangulation? Sorry, I usually look at that. I, I just want to thank NYWCA uh, also. Um, you've been inspirational and also been very involved. Like you said, you, you have supported a lot of bills that I ran this year, the court fee waiver and affordable housing. And I also want to echo like uh, Senator Escamilla because they, uh, I respect them. You learn more about the stories where we all come from. And I have such great respect for my colleagues um, and that I, we're here today. So let me tell you about this was very close to my heart. I remember uh, Senator Escamilla comforting me a little bit because I it, it was uh, very emotional for me, but I appreciated doing this bill. So this deals with the victim's uh, financial assistance. Um, if, if for violent crimes with their out-of-pocket costs, it's uh, the reparations fund. And so uh, this uh, is available to victims to pay out-of-pocket costs, such as funeral, burial, mental health counseling, out-of-pocket medical and dental. Um, but the problem is with it is that I feel they're re-victimized the victims because if something happens and they come, they have to report to law enforcement and they have to cooperate with the investigation and prosecution. And victims are not generally uh, in the beginning ready to do so. They need to take care of themselves first. And so I love this bill because, um, you know, uh, so a victim who suffers physical and a psychological injury or death as a result or injury, um, they can access this if they're sexually assaulted, um, they can uh, go to an advocacy service provider first. That just makes sense. They get the help that they need and this is part of the criminal justice system and, or they can do it to a non-government organization. Um, and then they uh, can have that advocacy service provider um, advocate and help them prepare a questionnaire. Now, we know uh, that recent trauma research and lethality uh, research around strangulation tells us that one of the greatest dangers that any person can face is being in a relationship and being strangled in the process or in the context of that relationship. And it's a high predictability about um, lethality. So, and it's probably the uh, highest risk domestic violence situation that we have. So in this instance, if a victim has suffered strangulation, the course in the course of interpersonal violation, they need to just report the strangulation to law enforcement officer or another federal state investigative agency after the strangulation occurs or seeks medical care 
immediately after the strangulation occurs. And that's really important. And so it gives them that option. And so I think through the years, we've learned more about the trauma and what happens to victims and that we know that we can't force them into, uh, you know, just going and prosecuting and some never do because of the, for many, many reasons. And so I really think this is a, a good step and it's an important step and something that I think we've learned from. And I was very happy to see the overwhelming support of that bill. Yeah, this is very exciting. It's the first time ever I think that people will be able to receive crime victim reparations without having gone to law enforcement. So just I love the innovation on this. Love that you're reaching more people and keeping more people safe. Now on to Representative Judkins. The bill that I want to mention right now, HB 359 eviction records amendments, isn't a domestic violence bill per se, but this is going to help so many survivors of domestic violence because what we see in the people that we serve is many are faced with evictions that stay on their permanent record, either because the domestic violence incident happened and they were evicted or because of financial abuse. There's a myriad of reasons. So because of your bill, as of July 1st, renters will be able to petition the court to expunge their evictions. And down the road, certain evictions will be automatically expunged after three years. And this is just incredible. Uh, going through the court process is going to require people to have extra, access to extra cash or work with an organization that can help them pay with those court fees, pay those court fees. Will you talk about why this bill was so important to you? and what is being done to educate the community and promote access to this new law? Thank you. Thanks for this opportunity to, um, to spread the word just a little bit, because I think this is how people will find out about, um, about the opportunity they have to expunge their evictions. Um, I've been, um, I've met with like Utah Legal Services and People's Legal Aid and the Utah Housing Coalition, who were actually very instrumental in getting this bill you know, going and, and, and getting it passed. And I'm meeting with the Bar Association, um, I think tomorrow, and I've met with the community health workers. And I think just the more that we can get this word out there, um, and especially as you, you know, mentioned domestic violence victims who, who through no fault of their own can have this eviction on their record. And so we just, um, I, the landlords, Association that it's the apartment association and also the realtors are also training their people in in this process. But I think it's I think the hardest place it's going to go, and I would love to get ideas for how we can we can help is um, or for like maybe undocumented um, people who have evictions who maybe are a little nervous to go into a court system anyway, right or or maybe there, and there's a lot of people who have language, um, language barriers. And so we want to get a really easy process in place. And that's kind of, we're working with um, the self-help center at the law library at the, to, to try to get, and also the other players that I said, to try to get a really simple um, application to petition the courts um, and get it translated and get it in the hands of as many community activists as we can. Um, and hopefully that will encourage people to do this. But like you say, there, there are costs that are involved. And right now there are ARPA funds, the same, the same bucket of money that is helpful, that, that helps people pay, pay rent um, from the federal government can also be used for this. And it's actually we're about, I think it's almost $90,000 of that money is going to be used by the courts to set up the automatic eviction, automatic expungement process. And that's how we could get the fiscal note so, so much lower. There's also, if, um, if it's stipulated during the judgment, if it's stipulated that there will be an expungement by both parties, that shouldn't cost anything either to get that done. That's part of that automatic expungement. And there's also the Utah Housing Coalition has I mean, they're very concerned about the costs for people and they are determined to fundraise or do whatever they can. And I know that there are a lot of, um, a lot of people who, a lot of lawyers who are really willing to help and try to make it so that it's accessible to those who, who really need it. And 
So anyway, I hope that answered your questions. And if you have any more, just let me know. That does answer my question. And, and thank you so much. I just want to take a moment to admire you and everybody else um, on the panel because your work doesn't end when the legislative session ends. You're still going. Interim sessions are coming up. There's still work on these bills. So thank you so much for being dedicated to that. And, and also mentioning making it accessible to undocumented folks because they often fear accessing the court system, accessing those resources. So I love that you're thinking about that and collaborating with so many organizations to make this accessible to people. Now we are going to move to Representative Romero. Uh, you had many, many bills that dealt with domestic and sexual violence. It was hard to pick the ones that we would talk about, but I want to mention a few that I think are, are really important that touch on different areas. So one is HB 126, Division of Juvenile Justice Services Rulemake Amendments, which was sponsored, co-sponsored by Senator Escamilla, and that seeks to improve prevention, detection, and response to sexual assault of minors in detention facilities. I was also hoping you could talk a little bit about HB 175, Protection of Animals, which allows animals to be included in protective orders. And then another, those two bills passed. One of the bills that you worked on that didn't pass but was very innovative is HB 352 online dating safety requirements. Will you talk about the need for and importance of these bills? Yeah, thank you, Gabe, for having me and appreciate everyone that's here today. And um, I'm also a big fan of the YWCA and all the work you all do. Um, basically my legislative career has kind of been, the foundation has is, is always been on sexual assault, domestic violence, human trafficking, preventative, education and, and legislation. And um, with um, the first bill that JJS actually approached me because last year, Senator Escamilla and I ran a bill to implement PREA, Prison Rape Elimination Act, because um, we're one of only two states that doesn't have a full PREA program. And one of the, re one of the reasons why we want that is so we can bring down federal dollars for um, sexual assault and sexual violence and provide more services for people who are incarcerated. So JJ, the JJS director asked me if I would do something similar for um, JJS. And, and so I did. And so that's kind of where that bill comes from. And they already have a grant. So they're already implementing some of this, but really this is um, our way of connecting um, our state institute services with our local nonprofits that deal directly with sexual assault. Because as we know, and as you and I have worked together, Sexual assault and interpersonal violence, there, there are some crossovers, but there's also differences. And sometimes one particular issue overshadows the other. And I don't want that to happen because both have um, great need. Both need a lot of funding and a lot of support, but there are differences. And so I want to make sure that I'm very clear about that when I'm you know, talking today, because sometimes people want to just paint it all with one brush. And, it, and it's not the same, especially when you're dealing with inter, interpersonal violence, when you're dealing with sexual assault, and then you're dealing with sex trafficking, three different different um, issues at hand. And I think we need to, as we move forward, that's something we need to talk about how we work together, but also how do we make sure that we're um, taking care of all of those services. In regards to um, HB 175, um, that was a bill given to me by one of my constituents. That was a bill I didn't think was going to pass. And um, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to pass that bill, but that out of all my bills, that was the most popular bill because people are, are so attached to their, their pets. Their pets are part of their family. They're their fur babies. And so I, out of all my bills, that's the, the one I got the most responses for and um, heard some sad, sad stories and heard, um, you know, people saying, thank you. This isn't to give me an opportunity to to leave a situation I've always wanted to leave, but I didn't want to to leave my pet behind with this person. And so, um, what this bill does is it allows somebody if they're going to get a um, um, they're going to get I can't talk today a stocking injunction or a protective order to be able to include their pet as part of that process. And what's really interesting is Senator Hinkins, who was my Senate sponsor's son, had a similar um, situation when he, um, his longtime partner, when they broke up, she took his dog. And so that he was very committed to this bill too because he saw it impact his, his family. And, and it wasn't necessarily, I'd say a domestic violence situation, but yet there was some stuff going on that they, they, they obviously split and she took his dog 
And, and so, you know, he was like, that would have been a perfect situation for my son um, to make sure he could get his dog and not have to go through all of that. Um, all the, that occurred with that particular situation in regards to my two bills that didn't pass. They just didn't pass because there wasn't time. Um, as you know, when the session ends and you get close to midnight, you're racing against the clock and your bills competing with 20 million other bills. And so those bills, two bills died on the, on the, on the third reading calendar in the Senate. And with the dating violence one in particular, I worked with Dr. Julie Valentine. She advises me on all of my bills and the Salt Lake County DA's office. And we wanted to ensure that if people are using dating websites, that um, the warnings are not buried in the background because a lot of times you're on a dating web. I've, I've never been on a dating website, so I'm not sure how this works for a dating app, but a lot of my friends have. But um, what we wanted to do was just kind of do some precautions and we wanted to make sure that we weren't victim shaming as well. And so that's where we brought in Dr. Julie Valentine. And we also wanted to make sure that if something happened, that somebody could um, could go to that, report it to the dating website and be able to access law enforcement or a rape crisis center. Because as we know, when sexual assault happens, not everyone wants to go to law enforcement, but we definitely want them to get the services and, and the help that they need to move forward. So um, the other interesting piece of this bill, which will come back again next year, is that if um, the dating apps or dating websites identify someone as someone who is not who they say they are, they will send a warning out to people that this person's claiming to be this person, but they're not, and letting them know like whether um, they've taken the conversation offline, because a lot of times you, you're communicating through the app, but if you decide to take it to your own phone or to your personal email, that they get this warning so that they know that this person might not be who they say they are. And so um, that's, it's a critical first step. It's um, what I like to go further. Yes, would I like to hold more people accountable? Yes, but for us, this was a, a first step in kind of putting some rules and regulations when it comes to um, the future, um, the current nature of dating. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so innovative and it's just so timely. And I think it's one of those areas where that's because of recent murders that have happened that have been connected to use of dating apps. I think it's also a place where we can raise awareness of what's going on. I think your remarks also make me um, just remind me that the legislative session is so dynamic and you never really know where things are going to go or where they'll, they'll end up. But I'm so glad that you ended up getting so much support, especially for the um, a protective orders bill for animals. And just so you know, Dr. Julie Valentine has a lot of research going that she hasn't published yet that I, I can't just share just yet, but it ties back to why we need this when it comes to dating apps and when it comes to sexual assault. And I, there are a couple of young women who shadowed me and there are also sexual assault survivors. And two of them told me that they met their perpetrator on, um, on a dating app. So it, it is something that happens quite frequently. Thank you for adding that. I look forward to when Dr. Valentine has published those reports. Okay, we're moving into the next section, racial and gender equity. At YWCA Utah, we approach our advocacy and policy work by centering those in our community who are the most affected, most impacted, or most burdened by any current or proposed laws. And we really want to encourage people to show up who they are and we strive to pave a way that creates safe spaces for them to thrive. And I've seen this um, with all of you in the session. So I'm gonna ask you one question about racial and gender equity and about racial equity um, and gender equity. What are the most effective strategies to gain consensus and make progress on racial and gender equity in Utah? And this is the same question for all of you. I'll start with you, uh, Senator Escamilla. Um, that's a very hard question, Gabe. If I had the answer, I'll be a millionaire right now. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I mean, and it's it's a it's a good question. So I I think for Utah, there is a very um, I think unique situation. And you know, I've been for six seven years. I've been trying to bring just data and research and and on and the state about uh, wage equity for example you know the the wage disparity and the wage gap and unsuccessfully being you know um pushed back on that piece 
Um, because we continue, just based on the limited data, we know Utah ranks the lowest, you know, or I guess the highest when it comes to, to um, you know, gender inequality with regards to wage gap, you know, wage, for example, the same with positions of leadership. So I, to me, I think um, the only way I think we're going to bring, we're going to close that one, it has to start, you know, in terms of lawmakers, in terms of policies and the institutionalization of those um, in, inequities. But there's also have to be, I think, a more um, concentrated movement of women supporting women. I mean, I think my years in, in advocacy and, you know, starting in college with, you know, many of, of people here that uh, we went to school together, you know, Angela and myself, Representative Romero and myself, we've known each other for a long time. And in that fight and in that process, I, it's been a, a learning curve for me to understand that at the end of the day, it's just going to take a village to build a village of women um, and closing those gaps of, of inequalities in everything, right? And, and then you add, if you want to add it a little bit more and just get it more complicated, then bring those women of color disparities because then it's they're in the gap gets even bigger. So I'm um, committed. And I think I've talked to many uh, individuals in this call. I see some names of people that I know, and I've had a chance to interact that really what's going to make the change is going to be bringing um, just women supporting women and, and really just push, pushing agendas that are policy agendas for in the case of lawmakers or others that are involved in policymaking that are really specific. As an example, you have, for example, the community health worker bill, right? That I um, that I um, sponsor this year. It took years to get us to pass this bill, but it's very unique and it's very impactful for women because mo most of the community health workers happen to be women. Um, it's like 90% of them or 92% of them. So I, to me, is is very intentional. Um, you know, all of the legislation that was um, described before by all my uh, colleagues are intentional to help women. I mean, it's helping any victim or survivor or anyone that's engaging in the case of, uh, for example, uh, Representative Jarkins that I uh, got to, you know, collaborate with her in her work and her commitment to, you know, just, for example, access to housing and, you know, making sure there's protections. I see the intention of women. I mean, we're always talking about what about women? What is that we can do? Because we know women are critical. I, another piece I will add right now is I would love to see more support of the Women in the Economy Commission, right? And and, and so that commission that, that now has been added to the governor's um, Office on Economic Opportunity, again, to connect the fact that women are also big contributors of our economy in our state. And as we continue to have a very strong economy and it seems to be a, you know, a badge of honor for our, our politicians and our leaders, which is great, then what are we doing to make sure that economic opportunity is also happening to women that are 52% of the population? So to me, it has to be intentional. It has to be strategic. It has to be on every conversation that we're having policy-wise. We have to add this idea that, you know, what about women and what about women of color, which continue to be that disparity? So I, I you know, it may be a more broad um, answer, but to me is I've shifted my mentality on addressing issues to have that be part of that conversation and think of that institutionalization of, of the isms that we have where women continue you know, to be disproportionately impacted. So if we can open access, if we can talk about change intentionally, we need to bring um, the reality and the fact that women continue to be lagging behind on opportunity and wage gaps and all of this as we continue the conversation of moving this economy and, and the greatness of the state of Utah, but having that component be added so it doesn't get lost. It, it is recognized and it's part of the policy lawmaking process. Oh, yeah, thank you for that. You said you didn't have the answer, but your answers uh, give me hope. And I appreciate that you are continuing to chip away with that and, and being willing to have those conversations and inspire others to do so as well. Uh, on to you, Senator Iwamoto, same question to okay. you. What are the yeah. most effective strategies to gain consensus and make progress on racial and gender equity in Utah? Thank you. That is a loaded question because it is true. There's um, such a... Uh, you know, just so um, important these days. I 
know that um, as a legislator and um, I represent my community, you know, my uh, constituency in my district in the state, but also what has been more uh, meaningful and has come back as I, uh, as the uh, communities of color that we represent. And so I just want to say too that, um, you know, for me as a AAPI, Asian American Pacific Islander, we've, it, just like other communities, it's been heightened by words and actions. And uh, it's no secret that hate has always existed going back to the Chinese Exclusion Act or even before that and the incarceration of Japanese Americans. And so I know through, you know, my, my parents who are in Issei and the generation before the Issei that, um, you know, your rights under the constitution can be taken away at any moment. And we know that history does repeat itself. And so one thing uh, that I wanted to stress as far as the Asian American Pacific Islander community is it's very um, uh, relatively invisible and dis indiscernible. And so people don't know there's 60 communities of color within AAPI and over a hundred different languages. And so, I think that's something uh, that we shed light onto these different communities um, and because they're not seen. And if you don't see them, you don't have to deal with them. You don't have to deal with the problems that come with racism, like the intersectionality of sexism and racism that happened in Georgia. While I was in law school, I think the things that moved me, of course, the incarceration issue, and I'm glad that we keep talking about that. Um, but also Vincent Chin, who was brutally murdered and blamed that he lost his job in Chrysler, uh, a father and stepson with a bat beat him in his head until he died and was, uh, and they got probation and a little fine and they thought he was, you know, going after Japanese. So it doesn't matter. It one thing impacts the entire community um, because it doesn't matter. Uh, there's no discrimination as far as who, who, you know, uh, it can go to the whole community. So that's been important in sharing stories of each community, uh, whether whoever we are, we share our stories so that people understand that we speak out. And I think having a lot of I've never seen as much um, in, you know, since I've lived here of the interest in these issues that impact our state and country. And, you know, recently um, it's been very charged uh, for many reasons and uh, they're not new, but we have panels and we have things like this. And we, the more we talk and hopefully stand in solidarity, um, with other communities of color. I think that's really, really important. And, and so I guess sharing stories and uh, it, there's so many things you can think about, but those are the things that come to my head right now. Thank you so much. And same question to you, Representative Judkins. Thank you. I would just say amen to everything that's already been said. Um, and said so so well. Uh, something I'm, you know, I'm in, I'm a Republican, so I'm I'm have a different um, experience maybe sometimes. And I'm in Utah County, so I have a different experience a lot of times than um, than some of my other colleagues. Um, and I think that it's really important to always have an open mind and approach conversations with. Um, with, with a desire to actually listen to the other person. And um, because you can't change hearts and minds if the other person's on the defensive before you ever start. And that happens a lot. And I think we need to be really careful about that. I think we need to be really careful and not let words, um, let, let other people define words for us. For example, equity, you know, the quality of being fair and impartial, but it's being defined in ways that are really negative by certain groups, right? Um, I just, anyway, I won't go into that, but we just need to be, um, I don't know, I think we, we can't let, we can't let groups, other groups um, co-opt the language and then use it against us, right? Um, also, from my point of view here in the Republican Party, 
getting more women is vital, getting more people of color, having a more diverse legislature that actually looks like our communities is vital. And I know that um, that conversations really are changed when you have a diverse set of people having the conversation. Um, I'm the only female legislator in Utah County and, um, and discussions are different when I'm in the room with our Utah County Republican Caucus, right? Um, anyway, I won't take up too much time because I think that it's already been said really well, but just keep having those conversations, keep pushing, keep, if somebody comes up to me, there's, you know, a guy will come up to me and say, Hey, I've been thinking about running. What do you think? And I'm like, how about have your wife run? Like, why are you running? And it's just like, what, you know, never, never even has crossed their mind that maybe their wife, wife might be the one. And then I can explain how important it is. You know, I, I don't know that I think he's great, but we need this other perspective at the legislative level um, and in every decision making area. So, anyway, that's all I'll say. Thank you so much, Representative Judkins. And, Representative Romero, um, you get the last word on this. I, I think Representative Junkins made a great point is you have to meet people where they're at. And so a, a lot of times people want to force things on people because I, I have a very strong personality. We all know this. And I, I always have to back take steps back to kind of understand where someone's coming from and also having them understand where I'm coming from because, um, you know, a lot of times people say they're afraid of me and I'm probably, at least can attest, Senator Escamilla can attest to this, I'm probably like the most compassionate forgiving person out of, out of the, out of, you know, the group of people we run around and I'm always giving people second chances, but there's these stereotypes about who I am, but that goes to what we're talking about right now. And so like, you know, I, I kind of always follow this bell hooks model is like, you know, you create spaces for yourself, but those spaces still aren't safe, safe. And so what we're trying to do is change these institutions and these structures so that they're more inclusive and how we get there might not be the route many of the folks on this phone call want to go, but where, as a good representative from Utah County pointed out, there are a lot of institutional barriers right now and how we have these conversations um, can make or break how we move forward because we do definitely have to be united because there are people that are um, taking the word equity and, and using it against it. I mean, there are certain words that I try not to use anymore up at the Capitol and I've advised some of you on that because if you do it, you're, it's dead in the water, you know? So you have to kind of figure out how to work that. I mean, we, we were on a panel together, myself and Representative Jenkins with a, a group of other people. And I wanna to talk too long because we only have 10 minutes of timing myself, but even talking about outcomes and opportunity was a debate amongst the women. And before I left, I'm like, okay, I understand why you're talking about opportunity, but I also want you to understand this, how I see opportunity, it's not the same as outcomes. And so we had this really in interesting conversation because there were some women there that were saying, well, it's about the opportunity. And I, you know, I, just, I had to share, well, not all of us have the same opportunities or not all of us have the opportunity to stay home. Some of us have to work. And so I think, that conversation opened up a huge, a huge conversation on what an opportunity and an outcome is. And so even having that conversation amongst women is challenging at times. And so, again, we have a, a long way to go to, to um, change these systems that have been in place that are so embedded that I just don't see them changing in my lifetime, but I'm going to keep on pushing and I'm hoping the next generation has a, a different um, world to operate in because I know the world I'm operating in is very different than the world my grandmother or my mother did. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you all for your really thoughtful and heartfelt responses and, and inspiring responses. We have 10 minutes left. Uh, so we are, we only have time for maybe two questions. And I, I want to ask, it's Transgender Day of Visibility, um, I want to ask about HB 11. Um, so there were a few gender, a handful of gender equity bills, but none received more attention than HB 11 student eligibility and interscholastic activities. 
And most everybody knows on the last slide of the session, a force substitute was introduced and passed both the House and the Senate, creating an outright ban on transgender girls participating in school sports with a triggering clause to create the controversial school activity eligibility commission if a court invalidates that. Last Friday, Governor Cox vetoed it, and the same day there was a special session to consider the financial and legal issues of the bill, and it also gave the Senate and House the opportunity to vote to overturn the veto, veto which happened. And then a new bill was introduced to hold harmless any school that enforces the ban and it provides $500,000 to the Attorney General's office to fund what is likely an inevitable lawsuit. Um, we don't have time to go through all the questions that I wanted to on this, but my question is, um, this is directed to Senator Escamilla and or Senator Iwamoto because you're both on Executive Appropriations Committee. And coming from an organization that worked with many others seeking appropriations, seeking funding for critical needs in the community, we're watching this. Some of us got funded, most people didn't get fully funded despite having an influx of federal funds. And so just thinking about the process of this, will you shed light on how the legislature was able to come up with $500,000 to defend an inevitable lawsuit when so many other bills and priorities for Utahns went unfunded or underfunded? Uh, Luz, I can just say a couple things is that this was from the beginning of the legislative session a priority for the majority to lead out on this issue. And so, um, you know, we disagree, of course, but this money was put forth knowing that there's going to be a lawsuit. And, and I believe it's going to cost a lot more because I don't think the commission is constitutional as well. But this was a priority. And that's, that's what it is. But I'll let Liz go on from there. So, I mean, I think a half a million dollars is not going to be sufficient. Um, just understanding uh, the legal ramifications and and what we're seeing in the courts, um, I, I think it's it's important to um, there's a policy very unique policy conversation there are unintended consequences that I I believe were not addressed adequately and we attempted to fix some of those unintended consequences of opening a very very large gate of discrimination. There's a because of the constitutionality of this bill, we know where that discrimination is now and it's pretty blatant but then there's this now massive um gate um to anyone that slightly may fit a certain uh, view and now is the gate open to question and demand certain uh processes that i to me was like man you're not only opening a gate for lawsuits related to um you know transgender uh, girls and women you're now opening to anyone that could potentially be a, a question and accuse of any of this stuff. So I, I'm really shocked because of, we know how expensive these legal fights are. And you, you tackle the issue of just the funding itself and essential programs. We are heading towards a, uh, a really bad economic um, out, outlook. I mean, I, I hate to say this, like right now we had this ups and downs. This is part of economics 101. Anyone that's been through those classes, you know, you have those cycles and I'm having already um, a little bit of, of um, trauma and PTSD on, on 2008, 2009, when we we're cutting horrendously amounts of programs. I'm telling you, we're heading in that direction. It's like, it's the writing is on the wall. Our economists have been very clear and to have this massive amount of responsibility on a legal matter that will be decided in court because there's already 10 or 20 other states on those battles to me was so fiscally responsible, set aside policy and, and, and the message to children. It's just that part, it's you know, mind blowing. So I, I'm really concerned because we don't have the money and, I, and it's gonna come from somewhere. In order to fund anything, you have to defund something else. I mean, there's a set amount of money and is not enough ever. It will never be enough. So I'm really worried about that financial component. And and you know, unfortunately, as Senator Wamoto explained very eloquently, you know, when it's a priority, it's a priority, and um, the numbers are there. So yeah, that that's I think the the response there. And not to mention the future economic problem from sports, the sports world. We'll wait and see how that impacts our bit economic too economy. Sure. Okay, thank you both for answering that. We could have had an entire uh, event on that, but I, I appreciate you speaking to that. We've got five minutes left. So I'm going to ask you um, a combination question. 
because I want to make sure we get in questions from folks who um, submitted them. So one question is, are there recommended steps you'd prefer organizations take to partner with you on legislation? What kind of speed would you like partnering organizations to take as legislation progresses? Steady, medium, or blazing fast? I like this question because it's folks being interested in collaborating with you on legislation and supporting supporting you on the work that you're doing. So if you would answer that, and then uh, what are you working on next? What are your top priorities? So we will uh, start with you, Senator Escamilla, if you uh, would answer those questions, let me know if uh, I need to read them. Um, you know, it's interesting. It's, it's a, I will say it's an individual answer on how every legislator has a different um, strategy and different style and working with advocacy groups. I, to me, as um, you know, some legislators, this is, you know, their full-time job. Others, uh, we have to, you know, handle another full-time job and sometimes little, little kiddos, uh, which, you know, requires some, so the, our dynamic may change there. But I will say, um, usually legislators, if they've been around the block, they know they want a stakeholders a group to come together. And sometimes it takes um, strategically more than one session to build things. So I, I would say just follow that direction. It's all about trust. The only thing you have in a, re, in a legislative relationship is your word and trust. And so do not inflate a reality of, of commitment. Be very honest with that legislator because that legislator is putting his or her name attached to this project and this idea and they they do it because they certainly believe on it or there is a connection with their their constituency but they rely on those advocacy uh, communities and organizations so do not break that relationship of trust so that would be my advice there too i'm 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 going to bring back my bill on children and and uh, all of these wonderful women uh, the women were all 100 percent behind on on covering all kiddos and removing barriers and i am I've never cried so much for a bill like I've cried for this bill. And I, I mean, it's embarrassing for me to say it because it's the same thing I said a year ago. And I think it was the same panel with Gab, with Gabe, um, with Gabby. And it, this bill is is really to me so important. I, I, we can be the, you know, the strongest economy in the nation and not cover kiddos. Um, it's heartbreaking. So I'm bringing that bill back and I'm working on some issues related to, um, you know, we did some stuff with driver's license and limited English proficient. We're now gonna do some with um, deaf and hard of hearing and see how we can bring uh, uh, bring some access. And one that I'm, I think many of you guys may be interested in is I am creating a very strong coalition right now addressing uh, serious concerns in the Department of Corrections related to medical services for inmates and people that are incarcerated. And um, it comes also from issues that were in the audit that happened from the state legislature. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, I was getting a bit of deja vu too, but like like has been said, it, it might take more or many sessions and I'm so glad you're championing that. All right, on to you, Senator Iwamoto. Okay, thank you. So when, um, you know, getting organizations together, like a lot of my bills, like the duty to intervene and report was a two-year process, just getting all the stakeholders together. When I started out, um, I, I feared going to people who might object to a bill, but you have to, <laughs> you have to get everyone at the table or you're going to get bombarded at the session anyway. So I learned that. Um, so I, like on that bill, we spent three hours every every meeting and on like water banking or whatever I did it's it going around all over the place and so and then one thing you have to know too is I make sure that I would always make sure that all the stakeholders uh were there but at the end sometimes you do need to wait till the end because a lot of these um well groups don't meet until right before the session or even during sessions so you know like the ccjj and all these other groups they don't meet so it it is uh some things come at the end, some things come at the session, but I try to be, I've always tried to be the most prepared because I don't want surprises as much. And so the bills don't end up maybe being as exciting because they're not as controversial by the time I end it. <laughs> but I feel like that has been good for me. And I, um, you know, being with all of you really makes a difference for me. And I had some, a uh, lot of tears to shed, um, but I had decided not to run again. And it's been kind of hard when I'm with all of you and I feel like, oh, 
man, I should do it still, but I had um, personal reasons of my mother being older and just thinking I didn't want regrets, but I'm still involved in working on a lot of things. I'm still going to work on some water things and some legal issues and kind of getting back to my roots as an attorney and working on Japantown and other things like that. So I'm going to be cheering there and doing, trying to help work in other ways to on these issues that are important to me. So, and thank you so much for you guys having me and the YWCA, because you've been at the heart of a lot of things that I've done. So thank you. Oh, thank you so much. No doubt you're going to continue to make an incredible impact in the community. Thank you so much, Senator. And also I need to leave right now. I'm sorry, because I have another panel, but thank you so much. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. And Finally, to you, Representative Romero, would you like me to repeat the question? Oh, no, Re Representative Judkins is before me. So oh, I wanna... I, my apologies. Representative Judkins, go ahead. You are on mute. Yes, you'd think I'd have the hang of this yet already. Um, so for me, the I like to be approached early in the process so that I have more time. Um, I know sometimes people will call me or approach me after the session's already started or a week before the session, it's really hard to get something going then. So, um, but I, most of my bills do come from my constituents or, or organizations, people that, you know, that know so much more about so many more things than I do and they bring them to me. And then, um, yeah, I, I really love it when they stick with me through the whole process and uh, help me out and answer questions and meet with the other stakeholders. And I do think it's really important, as has been said, that you you get the people who are going to be against the bill in the same room with you too, so that you can figure things out and 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 hopefully make the pie bigger, not just have to compromise to make a worse bill, but you know can make the pie bigger and and, and address their concerns. Um, I do have three bills that died um, on the Senate side at the end, and uh, I'm going to bring those back and. Um, they, anyway, somebody can look them up. I don't want to keep everybody here if they want to see, but we'll move on. <laughs> That's all. Okay. Thank you so much, Representative Judkins. And to you, Representative Romero. I would agree with everything that they pointed out, but I'd also point out if you are going to work with the representative, the early you approach them, the better. But also when the legislation process, the legislative process is happening, follow their lead. Don't think you know more than they do. This has happened to me before where I've worked with individuals or groups and they think they have a better approach. I don't work well with organizations when they do that because I, I know the people I serve with, I, I know what I'm doing. So if somebody is working with me, but they're, they think they, they can do it better than I suggest they run for office, I'm just gonna be blunt. Um, but also if you're working with me, follow my lead, because there's a reason why I'm, I'm doing it the way I'm doing it. And it may not make sense to the community organization, but there's a reason behind that because I've been there for 10 years. I understand my colleagues. I understand the inner workings. And so trust me as the representative, when you're working with me on the, on a bill. So I just think that's important to put in place, but I, I'm, I'm a, as you know, Gabe, I'm a team worker. I, I work with organizations a lot. Many of the people are on here. I changed my policy based on the input I get from, from that. So I'm not saying don't have that conversation, but once the session has started and there's a, a plan in place, please respect that representative and follow their plan. Cause I've had people who thought they were helping me and they've actually hurt my bills but they thought they were doing the right thing, but they weren't following my lead. And they actually hurt my bills because they were using language that didn't go with the other reps. And so I, I, I mean, murder and missing indigenous women is a perfect example of it. Like it almost died because um, one of the organizations that was working with me was passing out flyers talking about man caps. Am I concerned about man caps? Yes. But if, I mean, so it, you just really, I emphasize to people, follow the lead of the representative that you're working with because they kind of know the audience and you might too, but you may not know certain things that they know. Um, one other thing is I'm going to be writing a bill with um, Dr. Julie Valentine. Again, um, she did this big study about sexual assault and when it gets to prosecutors. So when it leaves law enforcement to the prosecutor's office, we want to start um, tracking what happens there because it's a huge issue. And so that will be one of my new bills plus my bills that died on the bill I'll bring back. 
Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate all of that advice. And I just wanna thank all of you panelists. We're making history here. You're making history. I'm so glad you were part of these conversations and thank you everyone who joined. Um, we will be sharing this out um, for those who may not have been able to be here today, but I just hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. And just again, thank you so much for your inspiration and your work. Have a great day, everyone.